Our guest tonight, Dr. Bradley Onishi, is a scholar of religion and co-host of the Straight White American Jesus podcast, um, which has more than 45,000 streams per month. His writing has been published in multiple outlets, including the New York Times and the LA Review of Books. Um, he's also a TEDx speaker, an author, editor, translator of four previous books. Um, he teaches at University of San Francisco, and he lives in the Bay Area with his wife and daughter. And we are so excited tonight to help him celebrate the launch of his book, Preparing for War. So please help me in welcoming Brad to the stage. Well, it's great to be here. I want to say real quick um, the I th the information that uh, on that bio is out of date. And so, Straight White American Jesus gets about four million downloads per month. Um, so just set the record straight. We're on video, so we got to make sure we got it. So anyway, um, all right. Well, I want to just say thank you. There's a lot of familiar faces in the crowd tonight. There's a lot of people I've uh, just interacted with, Instagram, Twitter, Discord. Uh, email, wherever. So it's great to meet you. It's great to actually get to like shake your hand and see you. Um, I'm just really thankful for your support, um, whether it's been of the podcast, whether it's been of my work, whether um, it's with the book. So thank you to all of you for that. It's, it's uh, overwhelming and, um, and something that really helps me. Um, this book is really um, two things. It's, it's partly my story, and I think a lot of you have stories that at least uh, overlap partially with mine or are somehow resonant with it. Um, and so I tried to tell a, a larger story about the history of white Christian nationalism through the prism of my own. Um, the larger story of white Christian nationalism, at, at least in this book, is really one that begins in the 1960s. We could have started in 1619, we could have started in with John Winthrop and the Massachusetts Bay Colony, 1630, but um, I started in the 1960s because I wanted folks to see that there really was a concerted counter-revolution in the 60s to all of the progress that was made to extend rights and representation to marginalized groups and communities in this country. Um, and so the book really, uh, in some sense, tries to zoom out and give us uh, an understanding, a 60-year sort of uh, track of how we got to something like the Trump presidency and Christian Trumpism and January 6th. So I want to read a little bit tonight, and it, it's, it, it does relate to what's happened since January 6th. Uh, we've just had the two-year anniversary. I know some of you may have heard way too many NPR segments and uh, you know, listen to too many podcasts, people who talk about it too much. But um, I do think there's something that's happening that strikes me as really important. One of the things I argue in the book is that throughout American history and throughout uh, various uh, events in history, we've had um, myths that really shape um, the kind of reality of, of the nation. So one of those would be something like the stab in the back myth um, in post-World War I Germany that really sets the stage for something like uh, Hitler's takeover of the National Socialist Party and the Beer Hall push, and eventually his um, that the rise of the, uh, the Nazi re uh, regime. One of the things that I talk about in the book is the the lost cause mythology, and the way it takes hold in the Confederacy or the former Confederacy in the South after the Civil War, and the way it really shapes things like Jim Crow, um, and as Heather Cox Richardson has argued, uh, the invention of the modern Western cowboy, the white version at least, um, and uh, so on and so forth. Uh, what I would argue is that in the two years since January 6th, what we have seen is myth-making in real time. Um, what we've seen is a sense in which um, the big lie has uh, not been uh, evaporated from our air. In fact, uh, there's statistics in here that show that more people believe the big lie now than did on January 6th. Um, which shows you the power of myth, and it shows you the power of storytelling. So, um, one of the things that I tell my uh, religious studies students is that myths are most potent and most powerful when they can be performed and participated in. And so you really can't have a myth that, that has any lasting significance unless you can participate in it, right? So uh, what's happened with the big lie is that there are now martyrs and relics and rituals that you can participate in that help extend it, help enact it, and help give you a role in that story. And that's really dangerous. So let me just read a little bit here um, about that. Americans went to the polls on November 3, 2021, but due to close races in Pennsylvania, Arizona, Georgia, and Wisconsin, Joe Biden wasn't declared president until November 7. By then, Trump's big lie was already gaining steam. He tweeted that Democrats had stolen votes, quote, where it matters, and by contrast to theirs, all the votes for him were, quote, legal. He called the election a fraud and urged supporters not to accept the results. Even in those early post-election days, it wasn't hard to see how the myth of a stolen election would gain traction among his base. 
As political theorist Hannah Arendt says in The Origins of Totalitarianism, in an ever-changing, incomprehensible world, the masses had reached the point where they would, at the same time, believe everything and nothing. Think that everything was possible and that nothing was true. Mass propaganda discovered that its audience was ready at all times to believe the worst, no matter how absurd, uh, and did not particularly object to being deceived because it held every statement to be a lie anyhow. According to analysis from the Washington Post, told Trump approximately 30,000 lies or falsehoods during his presidency. Uh, he claimed COVID was under control, that Representative Ilhan Omar supports al-Qaeda, that millions of people voted illegally in California, and so on, and so on, and so on. What we've witnessed since the 2020 election, and certainly since January 6, 2021, is myth-making in real time. National myths often develop slowly over several generations, so that by the time they wield power over any of us as individuals, we are fuzzy on the details of the origin story. But in the space of a few short months, we watch the formation of a story in which MAGA Nation is playing the role of aggrieved citizens who had their country stolen from them. The big lie is one narrative piece of a larger myth, and the United States has suffered the consequences of this larger myth before. After the Civil War, the Confederate myth of the lost cause, which has started in the resonances with Trump's big lie, took root in the South and then spread throughout the country with disastrous results. The period known as Reconstruction from 1865 to 1877 saw the passage of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, which abolished slavery and granted equal citizenship to black Americans, and it provided the vote at least uh, for black men. In the years after the war, the nation witnessed black Americans' integration of Southern political life. Local chapters of the Union League and other organizations mobilized black voters and fostered black candidates for local and state elections. In 1868, South Carolina had a black majority state legislature. And in 1870, Hiram Rebels of Mississippi became the first black American to serve in the United States Senate. For a short while, it seemed that liberty and justice for all was an attainable legal goal. In the late 1860s and early 19, uh, 1870s, however, white Southerners developed the notion of the Confederacy as the lost cause to combat the radical changes taking root in Dixie. According to proponents of the lost cause, the South was the victim of an invasion by Yankee vandals. In response, they framed themselves as occupying the moral high ground in the conflict, a class of honorable and loyal families who defended their soil and way of life in the face of undue Northern aggression. Like the myth of the Solon election, these claims are historically untenable. But the historical realities were less important to the power of the myth among its adherents and the stories, rituals, and symbols that developed in conjunction with the Lost Cause. As C.R. Wilson has argued, Lost Cause mythology was enacted through the rituals of Confederate civil religion. The funerals of Confederate soldiers, the celebration of Confederate Memorial Day, the pilgrimages made to the hundreds of Confederate monuments that had been erected by the dawn of World War I. Their rituals and symbols instilled in the younger generations a sense of the nobility of the Confederacy and the moral vacancy of its enemies. Together they supported a myth that was deeply religious in nature and that for many Southerners supplanted the historical record. The men who died in battle became its martyrs. The generals became its patron saints. The civil components of the lost cause were combined with Christian mythology. The South played the part of Christ in the Christian drama crucified, yet unrisen. The heroes, Robert E. Lee, Stonewall Jackson, and so on, became, uh, excuse me, uh, were saints uh, in this Lost Cause theology. The Lost Cause exerted immense influence over American law, foreign policy, and culture for a century after its inception. In How the South Won the Civil War, historian Heather Cox Richardson argues persuasively that even though the Union defeated the Confederacy on the battlefield, the South actually won the war. By using the Lost Cause myth, Southern whites were able to cultivate the reemergence of the KKK and create the context for Jim Crow laws. The myth then spread west to provide fuel for the Chinese Exclusion Act and acts of violence against Native Americans, all on the basis of resentment, ritual, and symbol, rather than facts or historical truth. It didn't whimper and die in the face of historical criticism. It persisted, and it grew. Generation after generation of white people used it to justify a world of prejudice and injustice, an America where white Christians remained at the top of American, America's political and cultural hierarchies from sea to shining, shining sea. The lost cause is an example of how myth works. Even if they draw on a measure of reality, they aren't primarily about historical accuracy. 
Myths are preoccupied with the past and based on a desire to mobilize a vision for the present and create a prospect for the future. A myth shapes reality through ritual which dramatizes its story and brings its adherence into collective participation. So what I would argue is that once we've, uh, what, what we've seen in the last two years and change uh, is the development of a myth that now has uh, avenues for participation. We now have uh, MAGA martyrs. Ashley Babbitt was killed during the siege on the Capitol, as you all know. A U.S. military veteran, Babbitt had for months said on her social media feeds that the 2020 election was stolen from Trump. She arrived on the Capitol on January 5 to participate in the Stop the Steal rally the next day. On January 6, Babbitt was the first to climb through a broken window leading into the Speaker's lobby, near to where members of Congress were hiding, and was shot by a Capitol Police officer. If one considers the J6 riot as an attempted coup inspired by the former president, it's natural to view Babbitt as someone who lost her life in the midst of a traitorous attack on American democracy. When John Hinckley Jr. tried to assassinate Ronald Reagan, no one, including Reagan's political opponents, tried to make him out to be a misunderstood hero or a sympathetic figure. He was seen as a threat to national security. Yet in MAGA circles, Babbitt has become a martyr in the quest to retake the stolen country. Who was the person who shot an innocent, wonderful, incredible woman, Trump asked Maria Bar uh, Baratomo. I will tell you, they know who shot Ashley. They're protecting that person. I've heard that it was the head of security for a certain high, of, high official, a Democrat. This is myth-making in real time. Trump turns Babbitt into an innocent female victim, despite the fact that she was attempting to enter the chambers where the Speaker and other members of Congress were sheltering from a violent mob. Next, the story becomes that the person who shot her uh, is MAGA Nation's enemy, a security officer for a Democrat. Trump offers no evidence, but it doesn't matter. Everyone listening got the idea in just a short paragraph. We all saw the hand. We saw the gun, Trump said. You know if that, uh, that were on the other side, the person that did the shooting would be strung up and hung, okay? Now they don't want to give the name. It's a terrible thing. Fox News host Tucker Carlson expanded on Trump's murder myth. Who did shoot Ashley Babbitt? And why don't we know? Carlson asked on his show, which averages 4 million viewers a night. Are anonymous federal agents now allowed to kill unarmed women who protest the regime? That's okay now? No, it's not okay. Again, Carlson's crafted narrative provides the foundation for turning Babbitt into a martyr for the MAGA cause. The words unarmed and regime frame Babbitt as a righteous protester, standing up to an unjust government, rather than a violent perpetrator taking part in the worst attack on the American capital since it almost burned down during the War of 1812. Since, uh, since Ashley Babbitt's death, uh, we've uh, had on uh, right-wing social media sites and other places the image of the first patriot martyr. She's been used as a totem for MAGA Nation's remembrance of J6, as well as by right-wing groups propagating anti-government and white supremacist messages. Her face appears on the flag used as a symbol for the proposed Million Martyr March on January 20, 2021. Uh, Arizona uh, Representative Paul Gosar uh, tweeted a picture of Babbitt in May 2021 with the words, they took her life, they could not take her pride. The ADL reports that, quote, posts across platforms have specifically noted Babbitt's race, one such post referring to her as a brave white woman in the white supremacist National Partisan Movement Telegram channel posted a memorial image with the text, Rest in White Power. Just want to uh, side note here that um, if we think about the lost cause and the Confederacy, um, at the heart of that was the idea of, of white, uh, white femininity as uh, perpetually innocent. And if you read Sarah Mosliner or um, other work on this, you'll realize that the idea of protecting the, the perpetually uh, innocent white woman uh, in this country from its invaders and its attackers and other folks um, is, a, is a, a theme that's been used uh, to great effect uh, throughout this country's history. And I think if, if you kind of read closely in the words I'm citing here about Ashley Babbitt, you can see that at play um, in this case. Um, the other folks uh, that uh, have become MAGA martyrs are those uh, imprisoned for their part in J6. Our, heights, our hearts and minds are with the people being persecuted so unfairly, said former President Trump. Uh, in, the, in summer of 2021, Representatives Gosar, Marjorie Taylor Greene, Louis Gohmert, and Matt Gates made headlines when they tra uh, tried to visit the jailed rioters to check up on the conditions of their confinement and ensure their safety. We have concerns about reports of the conditions of the prison where these detainees are being held and whether, in fact, there have been instances of abuse inflicted by other prisoners or guards. Not often you get 
prison abolitionist from the GOP, but here you go. Um, Marjorie Taylor Greene visited the rioters in jail, and she dubbed it the Patriot Wing, as she called it. According to Greene, the prisoners are receiving virtually no medical care, very poor food quality, and being put through re-education, which most of them are rejecting. Uh, in perhaps the most startling declaration, the Republican Party labeled the actions of rioters on J6 as, quote, legitimate political discourse. There's been rallies around the country, including New York and D.C. for the jailed rioters. Organizers compared their conditions to those of prisoners at Guantanamo Bay. In a letter from prison, one insurrectionist explained that he and his fellow insurrectionists are, quote, just regular freedom-loving Americans with a tendency towards humorous shenanigans. So, again, innocence, white innocence, Shenanigans is like, you know, hey, we just toilet papered some houses, uh, officer, like, we're 16, what's the big deal? Uh, why are you so upset? No big, no, no, no reason to, I don't know. I guess we see that. Yeah, no reason to persecute <laughs> us, you know? Making martyrs out of the jailed rioters is strategic. Martyrs are the exemplars of myth. They're the figures who embody the virtues that the community must emulate in order to create their ideal world. As the scholar of right-wing movements, Daniel Kaler says, Dying for the cause is usually connected to a heroic fight to the death against ideological enemies who in the end are responsible for the martyr's death or ideological steadfastness. Ashley Babbitt is now valorized as the first patriot martyr of the manga lost cause. She exemplifies the sacrifice necessary to take back the country. The jailed rioters are its political heroes, celebrated for their suffering at the hands of a fraudulent government. Now it's not just martyrs that have developed uh, in, in the last two years, we also have MAGA relics. On October 13, 2021, supporters of Virginia gubernatorial candidate Glenn Youngkin held a rally in Richmond. While Youngkin didn't attend, a number of MAGA heavyweights led the rally. Uh, former President Trump addressed the crowd via a recorded message, and his former advisor Steve Bannon was the headline speaker. But their presence isn't what makes the rally worth remembering. When the rally got underway, an American flag that, the crowd was told, a patriot had carried at the January 6th insurrection, was brought to the front and raised on stage. Rally goers then participated in the Pledge of Allegiance to what, in essence, became the January 6th American flag. It was an impromptu ritual created from the fabric of the traditional American Pledge of Allegiance, but imbued with new and startling meaning. As the rally attenders pledged allegiance to the American flag, they also pledged allegiance to the nation that Trump, Trump's team, and the rioters tried to create during the failed coup. The American flag to which they pledged allegiance that day became more than an item of ceremony. It became a sacred object. As a scholar of religion, Mircea Eliade explains, sacred objects exceed their bounds. They are more than just fabric, wood, or stone. Quote, the sacred tree, the sacred stone, are not adored as stone or tree. They are worshipped precisely because they are hierophanies, because they show something that is no longer stone or tree, but the sacred. A hierophany is an event that unveils the sacred. It reveals objects, lands, people, words to be set apart and special. For those pledging allegiance to the J6 flag, the American flag, already a sacred object, became more than an object of American patriotism. January 6th turned it into a symbol of a sacred battle and the holy mission of MAGA Nation. In the days following the attack, and I know most of you know this, prominent Republicans denounced the riot and Trump's actions, from Kevin McCarthy to Mitch McConnell to Lindsey Graham. However, once it became clear that Trump and his mob would continue to determine the fate of the GOP on local, state, and national levels, they quickly changed their tune. Republicans refused to support a bipartisan investigative uh, commission focused on January 6th, according to Senator Ron Johnson, of Wisconsin, the rioters are, quote, people that love this country, that truly respect law enforcement. <laughs> Representative Jody Heiss of Georgia went a step further by claiming it was Trump supporters who lost their lives that day, not Trump supporters who were taking the lives of others. Not to be outdone by his speech, Peach State colleague, Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene said in a speech on the House floor that the people who breached the Capitol on January 6th are being abused. A third congressperson from Georgia, Andrew Clyde, described the riot as a normal tourist visit. <laughs> Public opinion about January 6th shifted dramatically in the year after it happened, whereas 80% of polled Republicans condemned the insurrection in January 2021. By that summer, more than 50% of them were labeling it an act of patriotism and defending freedom. By September of that year, 78% of Republicans believed that the election had been stolen. So let's just, a lot of numbers there, right? If you ask folks um, 
uh, if you ask Republicans in January 2021 about J6, 80% uh, condemn it. If you ask Republicans in September, right, nine months later, okay, about it, 78% of folks say it was an act of, of patriotism. Okay? So you see the change there. In a piece, uh, research poll from the same month, researchers found that only about a quarter of Republicans view the prosecution of the rioters as very important. Six months ago, half said this was very important. So you can see, right, if you just track the data as the months go on, the kind of uh, understanding of January 6th as an act of patriotism, as something that uh, uh, was an attempt to uh, rescue or restore the country, grows in the Republican Party, right? But that's what the numbers tell us. The danger here is clear. When leaders mythologize J6, they not only tell inaccurate accounts of what happened that day, accounts that belie the overwhelming photographic and video evidence of the violent mob attacking Capitol Police. They also erode trust in democratic institutions and insinuate that the ensuing presidential uh, election, excuse me, presidential administration and perhaps other elected officials have been elected fraudulently. They are also fomenting public opinion against those attempting to prosecute the perpetrators of the failed coup. The myth, in other words, creates sympathy for the insurrectionists and it legitimates the uh, MAGA movement's violence. History shows us that this can have tragic consequences. And in the next section, and I'll stop there, I go on to show uh, basically the, the sort of scary parallels between the stab in the back myth used uh, by Hitler and others in 1920s Germany um, and the ways that it, it uh, really resonates with uh, the, the big lie and uh, the kind of uh, extensions of it in this country. I'll just note, uh, obviously uh, could put this in the book because it just happened, but on January 8th of this year, just uh, uh, you know, over a week ago, there was a similar uh, set of actions in Brazil. And you know, it's sort of a common refrain these days to hear that the United States doesn't make anything anymore. The factories are closed and we don't export anything. Um, but we do. Uh, the United States is still seen um, as a, a kind of exemplar in many ways. I don't know about y'all, but when I was young, I, I tried to travel as much as I could before I had to uh, you know, become a real adult. Um, <laughs> And uh, I remember sitting in a cafe in Croatia and hearing, you know, the Backstreet Boys, right? Or uh, a far corner of Bohemia and, and what thinking. Was the, what was the year? Uh, this 90s? Is, no, this is like 2007, 8, oh, right? Wow. And so, wow. a little behind, um, you know, on the dance floor. Wait, and I I on the dance floor in Hungary, hearing the, you know, Fresh Prince uh, theme song, right? <laughs> uh, it's a, it, you know, it gets the people going. Um, Here's the point. Um, those are funny examples, right? But it's very clear to me, if you look at what happened in Brazil on January 8th, uh, that there's a, a very much a copycat um, situation happening. There's a sense of learning. Um, in one of the other chapters of the book, and I promise I'll be quiet here in a second, um, I, I sort of lay out how that's not an accident. That the way that uh, Bolsonaro supporters in Brazil might have learned from Baga Nation in this country uh, especially the Christian stalwarts of both of both movements in, in both countries, um, goes back 20 years. And so uh, by the, the late 90s and early 2000s, you have really key figures in the religious right, um, people who are part of um, uh, Focus on the Family, people who are part of the World Congress of Families, people like Paul Weirich, taking regular trips and creating networks in countries like Russia. Because what they realized is, is we don't have the votes and the demographics keep stacking against us. And so uh, we're not going to be able to find a majority. And this is in 99, 2000, not 2020. And so what happens is they start to look to authoritarian leaders, such as Putin and eventually Orban, as exemplars of a Christian nationalist leader that can, who have set their countries back on track in the ways they need to be. And if, if we could only emulate that here, right, we might have a chance in their minds to set the country back on track the way it needs to be. And so when Brian Kloss, the political uh, theorist and, and political scientist, says that you know, there's authoritarian learning happening in the, in the uh, Bolsonaro uh, supporters learning from J6, uh, I think he's exactly right. But if you do the history on the religious right and Christian nationalists, they've been doing that learning for 20 years. They taught uh, really important sectors of Russian society, the family, family values discourse that many of you learn of, on uh, on the radio uh, from James Dobson in the 80s and 90s. They, they literally took it and, and, um, and oh, transplanted wow. it there. The Families Values Discourse is a great export of, Christ, of American Christian nationalism. And in return, those Christian nationalists learned uh, fundamental lessons about um, how you can save your nation by sacrificing democracy. 
And so when I say that, that power is the sacred value here, not democracy, that's what I mean. And so when I come back to the MAGA myths of the big lie, the reason it scares me is because if you look to the example of the lost cause, we don't have Jim Crow. We don't have Chinese exclusion. We don't have five million members uh, part of the KKK um, in some sense without right the kind of for for uh, bearer the precedent of, of the, the lost cause. Now this country is hella racist and it has been. So let's just say it. We're videoing it. We better say it, right? Okay. So we probably do have the KKK in some form, right? But what I'm what I'm getting at here is that myth is so so influential in spreading to the 20th century. The South loses the Civil War, and the 20th century, in some sense, is defined by the Confederacy's uh, understanding of what this country is and should be, whether that's the American cowboy, whether that's who can vote, um, whether that's uh, how you can vote, whether that's uh, Japanese folks getting incarcerated, whatever, right, during World War II. If I fast forward and I think about two years of, of uh, the big lie and uh, MAGA Nation after the insurrection, the numbers tell us that nothing has stopped the spread. It's like I view, right? Nothing has stopped the spread of that myth. In fact, that myth is just reality for tens of millions of Americans. And so if you don't adjudicate that, and you don't hold the people who are, uh, who are uh, responsible for inciting it responsible, what you get, and in the next section of the book I talk about this, is a situation where someone like Hitler goes to jail for a couple years, only grows in power, writes Mein Kampf, becomes more popular, and by the time he gets out, he has even more social and political capital than before, and we all know the history after that. And it's super sloppy, right? To use the Hitler example, we know, it's embarrassing. Come on, I mean, right? Why would you do that? You're, come on, you know, you have a PhD, get, get a life, right? But I think if you, if you drill down on the comparisons, at least on the myth-making, you can see the power, right? And so, do we need to do one-to-one -one comparisons of Hitler and Trump and all this stuff? We don't, and, you know... Please, you know, when you put this on YouTube later, just right, at least acknowledge that you know I said that. But I think the idea of myth as having uh, the opportunity right to shape reality is really really important. And if we overlook that, I think uh, we'll miss a lot of the story of January sixth. We'll miss a lot of the story of Trump Nation uh, and MAGA Nation, and we'll miss a lot of the story of how Christian nationalists um, strategize on how to take this country back and have been doing so uh, for a long long time. So, thanks. So, uh, re really interested in, in what you're saying about the myth-making martyrdom of Ashley Babbitt, and since we know that J6 and, and MAGA Nation is not, I don't know if you can even say primarily a political movement, it's not just a political movement, it's a religious movement, and you may be able to say primarily a religious movement. So it's turning her into a religious martyr. Mm -hmm. Uh, on, based on twisting the facts of what, what happened. And I, I, I think about, you know, you, you and I are around the same age. I think about the, the Columbine myth-making of Cassie mm -hmm. Bernal. Yep. Oh, that yes. That her, her story, like the, the, the story that initially came out was shown to not be true, but mm -hmm. when presented with the facts of it, even her pastor said, well, the church has their version of the story, and we're not going to change that. At that point, you know, a cottage industry had yep. sprang up. Um, to, to make money off of her, her story. And it was a really galvanizing martyrdom story yep. for for young people, for, for millennials in particular. There's a song on it. Oh, absolutely, <laughs> yeah. And, and so as, as you're framing this book as thinking about the, the logical logical place for for me Brad based on on what I was going through would be I yes I could see myself being at at J6 mm -hmm. it's now been two years from there I'm wondering like, as painful as it must have been to come to that conclusion I wonder if you've thought beyond that and thought where you would have seen yourself reacting in the years since then if Ashley Babbitt is somebody that you would be valorizing yeah. if, if you'd be uh, still, you know, wanting to go to the Reawaken America yeah. tour or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's a great question. So, um, so the country's best myth makers, in my view, are it are the pastors and the and the radio hosts, right? Like, so some of y'all grew up with dads who just their religion was Rush Limbaugh, oh, right? God, yes. And some of you grew up in church, and you know the best storyteller you ever met was your was your pastor, right? 
And when I say myth, right, you can get hung up on myth as mythological as not true. Oh, it's, it's not real. Um, you know, Santa Claus or something. Okay? But I think when we think of myth, uh, we need to think of stories uh, through which we make meaning. Okay? And so the, the veracity of them, the historical details of them are often um, not as much, um, or not as important perhaps, as what they do for us. Okay? So what I'm interested in as a scholar of religion is what does religion do for us? Okay? So the, the, le like the sixth question I ask is, what do people believe, right? The first, second, third, fourth, and fifth are like, what do people do? What does it do for them, okay? So here's what myth does, and I, I'm going to ask, I promise I'm going to answer your question directly. Uh, what myth does is it gives you something to participate in. You get to play a role. You, you may not be a main character. You may be behind the scenes. You may be an extra. You may be a supporting actor. You may be something. But you get a role. And it also gives you a community to participate in. So you get to go yearly or monthly or weekly or daily, and you have a place to participate, and your life has a story, right? And for so many of us, especially through the pandemic, right, it's so hard to find your life story, the people that you live your life with and the stories you're going to live out. It's hard. Like, it's really hard, and, and it's, just, it's just not easy. So when you're in church and you hear about Cassie Bernal, right, and I'm, I'm like, you know, 20, 21 uh, in terms of age at this point, I got like a thousand people in church and we're all listening to the pastor tell a really, really good version of how Cassie Bernal stood up for Cassie Bernal's Christian faith during, during Columbine. And the first thought when you're in that mode, whether you're a judge or a lawyer or a college kid, is not, I wonder if that's true, that dude up there telling me the truth right now. What you're thinking is, is wow, what a story, what an example, and that person is living out right? What we're trying to live out. That is inspiring me. So maybe later you'll ask, is that true? Maybe later you go to the barbecue and your cousin's like, hey, that didn't actually happen that way. And you're like, okay, whatever. I, you know, you know, but isn't that amazing? Isn't it inspirational what she did? Right? So what I'm getting at here is I think 20 or 21 year old me, right? As, as, you know, sort of heady as I am. And, 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 you know, my wife would say as anxious and overthinking as you are, um, <laughs> Would have, would have not wanted in the moment of hearing the story to excommunicate myself from the community that is living that story out and would want to say, wow, this is, amazing. This is only going to make us stronger, push us together, and we're going to keep walking this road together. Mm -hmm. So that's what myth does for us. This is why myth is so much harder, right, to uproot um, than, than other things because it's not just about belief in a story. It's about living a story. And when people have that, and some of you have done this in church, some of you have done this in political organizing, some of you have done this in um, Dungeon Dragon Group, whatever, right? It's really hard to think, if I give up living this story, I give up community. I give up my role, I give up my identity, I give up everything that I get to play in this world in terms of uh, something that's actually uh, significant and meaningful. So giving up the myth means giving up myself, and that's really hard, right? It's really hard. So I think 21-year-old me would have been just nodding along in the sermon like inspired, ready to sing another worship song because mm -hmm. he got the chills and really wanted to um, be part of something that felt really important um, and really uh, challenging, you know, so, all right. Yes? Okay, it's hard to frame, but anyway, <clears throat> so, um, I feel like I came to all of this, like I knew nothing about Christian nationalism, I knew nothing about it before, I still know nothing, however, I'm learning. Anyway, I'm watching the January 6th riot from my workstation at work, and I see this guy wearing a talus like my dad did, okay, because I was brought up in a, a very, actually, pretty conservative slash orthodox Jewish home, and blowing a shofar. Yeah. And I'm just like, wait, okay, what am I missing? I thought this was all the just like the, you know, sort of economically distressed people who still believe in Donald Trump and, and like, they're <laughs> angry because they lost the election, you know. And then all of a sudden it took on this really, and I'll use this word, but thank you for it, this, like, gothic, epic imagery hearkening back to sort of, like, my childhood and seeing all this stuff, I'm like, what is going on here? Like, I have no idea what has gone on in my country. <laughs> yeah. Like, help. And so I really love finding your podcast, and I really love listening to the um, the series you had in the yeah. Apostolic Reformation. But I'm still unclear. Okay, so with that in mind, I'm still unclear as to how 
the relationship between like the rise of anti-Semitism yeah. in these groups like relate to that sort of honoring of of like the, most the symbols? Religious. Yeah, yeah, like the most religious parts of it. I I can't. Yeah. I'm quite. Yeah. So if you could comment no. on that, that'd be amazing. Absolutely great question. Thanks. Thanks for asking that question. Um, so I think. Um, there's, a, there's a number of things to talk about, um, so uh, if you, I'm sure most of you do, but the shofar is a, is a, basically a ram's horn that's used traditionally um, as a kind of battle cry, right, in Jewish history, Jewish community, um, Jewish ritual, and so on. Um, and it's been basically co-opted by a number of uh, Christian communities in uh, recent decades, uh, most notably uh, Pentecostal communities and, and, charis and, and other charismatic communities that are, are perhaps not Pentecostal. Um, so you see these at January 6th, and I talk about them in here, um, in, in the Insurrection chapter. I talk all about them. And, uh, if you don't know her, uh, Leah Payne, uh, who teaches just down at Portland Seminary, is a really good scholar on, on all of this. But um, the shofar, um, does a, it, there's a couple of things at play here. So one, I don't want to overlook, that it is literally a religious instrument used as a battle cry. So for me, January 6th is a, is a religious battle. Um, and Christian nationalism is a really good integrating mechanism that tells a story, as we just talked about. It tells a myth about the country, about how it's been stolen, about how uh, it should be and how it could be if we, if we all work together. So if you're a J6 and you're a proud boy, you're a Christian Pentecostal, right? You are um, somebody who just came um, because you had uh, uh, some friends encourage you to. You're a three percenter, right? You're um, a, a megachurch pastor. Uh, you're a wealthy realtor from Dallas. Pretty much. That Christian sort of story that we just talked about is expansive enough to bring you all in. You may not have been church to church for five years, okay? But you're like, yeah, I'm a God-believing patriot. I'm here for God and country, right? So it can bring you all under the same righteous umbrella. And the story you tell that day is we are not invaders. We're not treasonous. We're not trespassing. We're here in the people's house because we're the real people, right? And we're going to take it back from those who are not. And so the, the religious story provides an on-the-ground justification or permission structure, that is what Peter Manso calls it. Um, now, how does this have anything to do with anti-Semitism? Right? So I think the larger question is, is how can you be a Christian who adopts uh, Jewish symbols and Jewish instruments, um, who appropriates them? So I've been, I've been to like um, New Apostolic Reformation revivals. Um, I went with Catherine Stewart. Some of you, you all know Catherine oh, yes. Stewart, power worshippers. And we were in D.C. at the Trump Hotel um, on the fifth night of Hanukkah oh, wow. at a New Apostolic Reformation revival. And Catherine didn't grow up with this stuff, so she's just like being such a pro, like reporter. And I did grow up with this stuff, so I'm like, I don't know if I can be here. I, <laughs> I went to the bathroom like 70 or 80 times. Um, so, but what was there? So many menorahs, I, I, I couldn't count. Right? I mean, there were more menorahs um, in that uh, space than I'd ever seen. Why? Because there's this, I think, paradoxical and in some sense just outright incoherent idea in these spaces that the Jewish people were chosen by God to play a special role in um, human history and in, in God's creation. And their role was so important that, uh, you know, the, the, the sacred text, the, the Old Testament Hebrew Bible, uh, remains, right, um, just a core part of, of the Christian story. And so, uh, not only that, let me just back up here. So the history is really important, the past is really important, but the future is also important, that Israel will play a key role in the end times, in the eschatology, in Jesus coming again, right? It'll be a key battlefield, it'll be a place where really key events take place. So the past and the future, Israel's really important in this vision, okay? So there's this sense of, we love Israel more than anything. Right? Doug Mastriano ran for governor and PA, and Doug Mastriano and his wife are the kinds of Christians who never stop talking about how much they love Israel. Okay? And, and if some of you might have seen the clip where she got up and said, I love Israel more than most Jewish people. Right? Okay? And the sentiment there is, I recognize Israel's actual place in divine history, and most Jewish people don't. The, the scholarly term that some of you, I'm sure, know is supersessionism, right? That mm -hmm. Judaism is now defunct, and it has now sort of um, served its purpose because Christ came, and the real people of God are now the Christians. So if you're a Jew, right, yes, you have a great heritage, you just, you just haven't really completed the, the thing. And so 
if you would just recognize that Christ is the one you've been waiting for, you can actually get on board and live with us in the, in the present as God's people. But for now, you're really just kind of defunct. You know, you're, you're really kind of played your role and you've, you've like refused to, um, to, to take part in God's uh, kind of uh, second revelation, right? Anti-Semitism. Well, it's really easy. Uh, in these communities, to profess love for Israel, to have a shofar and blow it in your in your worship uh, 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 session, to have menorahs all over the place, the Jewish flag, you will see Jewish flags, or Israel, Israel, the flag of Israel all over the place, you'll see the Star of David, blah blah blah. It's a love for Israel and no actual interaction, respect, or involvement with Jewish people. Right? And so there's this sense in which I love you as a Jewish person more than you love yourself because you're you're self-hating because you don't love Jesus, mm -hmm. right? Oh, wow. yeah. And so it's incredibly offensive. It's, uh, it's incredibly, um, and so, like, l let me give you one, like, more uh, historical example of this, which is um, the KKK, right? So we all know the KKK was uh, a virulently anti-black organization, right? Mm -hmm. Terrorist organization, still, right? That's, that's what it was. So we all know about lynching. We all know about burning crosses. But the, the KKK really had three main prongs, okay? Virulently anti-black, okay? Also, overwhelmingly Christian. Mm -hmm. Like, the way the KKK explained itself is we are a Christian organization. We're a Protestant organization. Mm -hmm. We are the Americans who love Christ. And we are the Christians who love America. That was the KKK. They'd show up at your church, and they weren't like, hey, should we be virulently anti-black anti today? Right? That, they would say, hey, let's sing in the choir. Who wants a potluck? You know what? We brought all the food. We'd love to donate to your church. And so people would go home and think of the KKK as this great American patriotic set of boys who were out there uh, doing what God needed in, in, in the United States. But the KKK was anti-black, thoroughly Christian, thoroughly anti-Jewish, overwhelming, and anti-Catholic. Okay? So I, my students are always asking me, how can you be in the KKK and you love Jesus, a Jew, right. and you're thoroughly, overwhelmingly, explicitly right, anti-Semitic. And the KKK would twist themselves in a knot, talking about how Jesus was like a true Jew, which is really a Christian, but not, like, not really Jewish, and every, everyone else who is Jewish is actually worth our hate and worth our condemnation. And, right? and the, the gymnastics, theologically and philosophically, are, are really never successful, but you can see them trying to get it on the page in ways that are just like, we've, we've got to try to cohere this, and it actually never works. But nonetheless, uh, the kinds of things you're talking about with the, the contemporary moment go all the way, they go back a century um, to one of our, our first terrorist organizations. So, long answer, I hope I touched on all three. I'm happy yeah, to. Yeah, no, yeah. I mean, there's, there's just so much about it that was just shocking. Like, I just, I don't know where I have been for 30 years while this has all been unfolding. Yeah. And I guess maybe it's because it's so incremental. And it just kind of blasted on the television, and I was like, oh, I have to figure out what's going on. Yeah. Well, and the religious imagery of J6, once you start yeah. looking for it, it is Everywhere. ubiquitous. It's Everywhere. ubiquitous, yeah. And it's once you see it, you can't unsee it. And so, That's what I noticed. I was watching yeah. the clips, and it's like, wow. What it's, are they talking about now? I mean, like, now that it didn't work. Now that, now that, I mean, the next, I don't know what their next plan is for all this. Yeah. You know, other, other than exporting to Brazil, but... I mean, how did they explain how that, how that prophecy did that Donald Trump would have a second term did not yeah. come about? Like, like uh -huh. this week, what are they talking about? You know? Well, so let's go back to the lost cause, right? The South, the South didn't win the Civil War, right? So the lost cause was a myth that said, right, like Christ, we will, we might seem like we're crucified, but we will rise. The South will rise again, just like Jesus. And so the, the, the thinking is not, well, you know, they got us. Let's, let's take a pickleball. A lot of my friends have been doing that. You know, like the, the thought is um, this is the first battle, and we will remember this battle. We might not have taken back our country on January 6, 2021, but we're going to win the war. We will win the war. That's, that's the thinking. And the thing is also that Donald Trump is president, but a fraudulent, globalist, godless, secularist, uh, government, uh, led by, you know, everyone's favorite Marxist, Joe Biden, um, is, you know, totally taken, um, taken what is rightfully Trump's and rightfully theirs. So it's not a narrative that says, all right, they got, you know, you got us, we'll, but we'll be back. It's a narrative that says, 
Um, Trump is actually president. All right. J6 is the beginning, not the end. Mm -hmm. And um, I think there's legal and extra legal ways that that's being extended. So, and I can talk more about that too. But um, anyway, I want to give other folks a chance. So, yes, I mean. I was just going to say a lot of times I think about, um, like when I read Malala Yousafzai's book about um, the rise of the religious right in her country basically, yeah. she talks about how it started with conservative radio coming to the area and how that was a building block and so I've done a what lot of things. country is she from by the way? Pakistan. Thank you. Yes. Um, so um, oh, I've, oh. I've done a lot of thinking about how, how strong of a force right-wing media is, mm -hmm. but I guess also the other part that's missing there is I grew up with a family dynamic that was always everywhere, don't talk about politics, don't talk about religion with people. Like, mm -hmm. And so I feel like that was a very prevalent theme that I'm not necessarily seeing get brought up in a lot of the books that talk about mm -hmm. the history of the rise of the religious yeah. right in our country. Yeah. Do you think that at any point having those dialogues earlier would have made a meaningful change, or do you think that the rise of right-wing propaganda would, would have gotten us here regardless? Yeah, I think, so, this is a fantastic question. So if you haven't read, um, I'd give everyone a, uh, a recommendation, The Shadow Network by Ann Nelson, oh, yes. and Ann is with an E, and it's it will really help you understand the rise of uh, right-wing media uh, for the last kind of century and a half. So I think we've had it for a long time. Um, right-wing media, and we've had people who have lived, you know, people talk about echo chambers and silos, um, as you're saying, those have existed, right? But what I, what I hear you saying is, there was a sense in which you didn't need to talk about politics at every barbecue and every family dinner. Everyone kind of knew who you were supposed to vote for, and it was just, it was really, the talk was more about, correct, well, we didn't go ahead. Start and stuff. Yeah. You know, everybody has such strong feelings because those are the two biggest things telling people how to live their lives and what yeah. is acceptable. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, no, no. That, no, no. You're right. No, it's right. So here, here's what I hear you saying, right, is if we go back 15 years, um, if we go back, you know, turn of the millennium, 2005, somewhere around there, um, you have a situation where it does not feel as if, you know, the, the, the neighbor up the street who is Republican needs 18 Trump flags. Right? Sure. But some of you have those neighbors, okay? What happened? And I think, for me, some of this is media. Some of this is ways that, and if you, if you watch um, uh, people you may know by uh, um, Charles Creel, and I'm going to forget uh, the other creator's name, but I've interviewed both of them. They really show the micro-targeting apps that were developed uh, in the GOP and by right-wing um, uh, organizations way before uh, anyone kind of realized it, right? So where you go to church, and you sign up and say, hey, I'm so-and-so, mm -hmm. and then you give them all your info. And right. you just think, hey, I'm signing up to tell the church, like, you know, my email address so they can send me stuff about the kids program. And they're sending that to, the, to uh, Republican operatives, mm -hmm. right, who are then going to try to target you on issues. Like, if they know you're going through a divorce or you're struggling with addiction, and they can sort of, like, find ways to reach you with messaging. That, that's been going on for a decade, right? So I think we could talk about all of that, I think. But I, here's what I don't want to overlook is um, this Barack Obama. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, right? Okay. George Bush was supposed to scratch the itch. George W. Bush. Yes. He was going to be the first Christian president in a long time. Right? Ronald Reagan made promises. He didn't really come through by the 86, 87, like the fall walls of the world are, are fed up. If you all remember Pat Robertson, right, ran for yeah, president yes. in 88 because they were fed up. They are like, we need one of us, not Reagan anymore, right? Mm -hmm. And then it was uh, Papa Bush, right? And he was like this wishy-washy Episcopalian rich guy, you know, it was, he wasn't a real evangelical. Mm -hmm. And then we got Clinton, you know, no. and he was out there doing what he does, okay? So George W. Bush was going to be the evangelical, real Christian president. Yeah. Jesus saved him from alcoholism, he, he changed his heart, he said on the debate stage. And like George W. Bush just didn't scratch the itch, right? It was like when you really think it's going to like, you're going to, you know... You ever that hankering for junk food at midnight? And you're like, you know, if I just eat the Fritos, I'm going to feel better. And you don't. You feel terrible. And it just, it actually didn't help anything. Okay? And then after George W. Bush, we keep seeing gay people on TV. And we keep having um, LGBT folks push for rights. And we keep having talks about immigration. And we keep having um, talks um, about different kinds of families. And people with, yeah, uh, you know. Um, uh, Unconventional truth came up. Issues with, with uh, uh, global warming and so on. And then Barack Obama comes to the presidency. And he's like built like 
in a lab of everything that the white Christian nationalist is afraid of. Right. He's, he's like a, he's like the predator, right? It's like they, they sent him back, you know, from the future. He's mixed race. He's got a black father who's an immigrant, who's Muslim. He has a black wife, black children. He was raised in Hawaii for, for a lot of the time. Like, my family's from Hawaii, you know, people don't really consider it a real state, you know? Oh like, there's people where I grew up, we'd say, hey, you're going to Hawaii, did, did you change your money? You gotta get Hawaiian money. And they'd be like, oh yeah. Then they'd go to the bank and ask for Hawaiian money and then, you know, be embarrassed, right? But like, but like, if you think of Hawaii that way, that's, it's like Hawaii's not, Hawaii is not, you know, Illinois, oh Hawaii is not God, Texas. hilarious. So, Barack Obama's built in a lab Everything they're afraid of comes to fruition with Barack Obama. All of a sudden, gay marriage is legal. Okay? And guess what? It's time to talk about religion and politics at the dinner table. It's time to use spiritual warfare language. It's time to get, as the, the ministers say in our series, our, our, our swords bloody. It's time to get our feet muddy. It's time to become warriors. It's no longer time okay, for rallies and prayers for the country. It's no longer time for see with the poll and for Jerry Fall to have an I Love America rally. That's not going to do anything. I don't need Mike Huckabee and his silly jokes. I don't want to have, you know, someone uh, like uh, Marco Rubio, right, just tweeting out Bible verses. I want somebody who's going to take this country and put it where it needs to be. Because all the people who are not real Americans and have no right to what they're, what, what they're doing and what they have and what they want, they keep winning. So I'm going to talk about this at the table. I'm going to talk about this on Facebook. I'm going to talk about this um, anywhere I can. And I'm going to vote for somebody who will brutalize them. I'm going to vote for someone who will bloody them. I'm going to vote for someone who will bully them every chance he gets. Because I'm tired. I'm tired of George W. Bush saying Jesus changed his heart. And we still have all these folks who I don't consider real Americans. Right? Immigrants and people of color and mixed race folks and indigenous folks, and black folks, and queer folks, and they're still up in my space, and they're still claiming this is their country. So let's do it. Let's build a wall, let's get a Muslim ban, right, and let's do everything we can um, to, uh, to set this country back in order. I will say, right, the advent of social media just makes this work, but I, I, I don't think social media is a qualitative change, I think, right, I, I think it's a quantitative change, but it, but it does, it does, it does, for sure, it does. It does. It does have an effect, right? For sure. So, anyway, um, other questions? What are, yes. Um, what extent is religion being used as a cover for other motivations? Yeah, yeah. It's a great question. So I think. Um, so I think there's. It's it's easy to think of uh, people having these kind of um, spheres in their lives, right? Um, you know, we wake up and say, um, you know, this is. Part of my identity, racist. You know, part of my identity, homophobe. Part of my identity, kind of loosely Christian. Um, and I think it's easy also to think of like religion as a thing and politics as a thing, and sometimes they overlap, right? Sometimes they don't. Um, I think what I would argue is that, and part of the reason I wrote this book is to show that um, it's a lot harder to disentangle what we would call like um, political motives, um, culture wars, and what we just sort of broadly call religion. Um, and just separate them into their kind of distilled, right, uh, pure uh, domains. Um, what I would argue is that you can see how um, many religious people have been radica radicalized politically. You can also see how many people who have already been radicalized politically find the Christian nationalist story to be very um, sort of uh, resonant with the one they're trying to tell and one that's helpful. So I guess for me it's not so much people saying, hey, if we just use religion, we can actually um, get things we'd like. I think it's a little more complicated. It's, it's a lot, it, I guess what I'm trying to say is it's hard to, to, to do the chicken and the egg here, right? Where the politics first, was the religion first, was politics first, and then like religion was used, just used to justify it. With that said, um, what I've maintained for years is that Christian nationalism is a really um, nimble and agile and ingenious narrative to use um, for the rise of right-wing extremism. Because what Christian nationalism does, it gives you an expansive story, right? A story that goes to the end of time and the end of space. It, it, it really supersedes any individual movement. And so if you tell the story of a Christian nation chosen by God to be a city on a hill, what you have is a story that really has a chance 
to bring under its umbrella, right, anyone who wants to somehow restore the country to what it should be, and that usually includes uh, building really uh, uh, strong alliances among, right, white nationalists, uh, people who are xenophobic, right, people who are transphobic, people who are homophobic, uh, and so on, and that Christianity can be a, a sort of really great uh, kind of uh, overarching narrative that brings everyone into a big tent, right? So, don't get me wrong, are there politicians who cravenly use religious language to get votes? Of course. But I do think that most folks who are part of the kinds of movements I, I talk about in this book um, have a, a genuine sense of themselves as religious people, right, who also hold um, certain political views. And anyway, I could talk more about that, but I hope that makes sense. I'll give you one example real quick, and I, I promise I'll keep this brief, is in the wake of the, George, the murder of George Floyd, there's a baseball player for the Mets. And he... Um, is the only one who doesn't kneel before the game, right, uh, when everyone else kneels. I mean, it's like, you know, 60 people kneeling on the field, he's the only one. White guy, pitcher for the Mets. And afterwards, the media runs up to him, of course, and is like, you didn't kneel, how come? You're the only one. Everyone on, every, on, on both teams kneeled. White, black, uh, people of color, it doesn't matter. And he's like, I can't kneel, I'm a Christian. Okay? And in that moment, if you're the reporter, right, if I think myself, I'm like, what do I say in response? Because if I say, well, what does that mean? I'm going to be on Fox News that night. Anti-Christian reporter grills man of faith for his, for his belief in God and his Christian values. So as a reporter, it's like, what do I say here? And the reporter said nothing. They're like, okay, he can't kneel because he's a Christian, right? If he said, I can't kneel because I don't like black people, he's out of the league. I mean, he's not on the Mets anymore. It's over. A couple weeks later, a reporter says, hey, you said you can't kneel because you're a Christian. What church do you go to? And he says, I don't go to church. I haven't been in church in years. No. Okay. So the Christian story, do I think he thinks, do, when he goes to bed, do I think he thinks of himself as a Christian person? I do. Yeah. But in that moment, his unwillingness to take a stand with everyone else about police brutality and social justice, right, the Christian story gave him what he needed, right, to kind of explain himself to the world in a way that he would not be just labeled a bigot, a racist, something, 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 right? And so I think that the Christian nationalist story is a really good uh, broad tent that gives folks ways to explain their views and make them out to be victims and just good old people of faith who are being attacked for their traditional values rather than, right, white supremacists or homophobes or anything else under the sun. So anyway, I hope I answered your question in, in some way. Two more and then we'll, yeah. Um, so thank you so much for your talk. Um, my, my name is Chris Townsville and um, I work at the UW. And so I'm wondering if you could speak to kind of the role in this whole narrative about basically Christianity on the margins, right? So, like, as someone who works on kind of Christianity and politics in South Sudan, people there for so long used Christianity as this, like, refuge and as this ideological kind of thing to fight, you know, Arab and Muslims and stuff, right? And so I'm wondering, in the U.S. context, right, while the lost cause was being perpetuated and things like that, you always had yes. African American Christians who, you know, were approaching Christ as this kind of like liberatory, right? James Cone, right? Yes. And so I'm wondering in the year 2023, as white Christian nationalism is in this very kind of dynamic, you know, um, state, what about, you know, those who identify as Christian Americans but aren't white. Yeah, <laughs> right. Like, yes. Yeah, yeah. Th thank you for that question. Mm -hmm. And thank you for, for, um, for providing such uh, important context there. Um, one of the things I, I do with my students is we talk about the city on a hill motif and the way that it sets up um, power brokers in this country to claim the role of Jesus in the story and everyone who's listening is disciples, right? Matthew 5.14, you'll be a city on a hill. So when John Winthrop says it in 1630, He's, he's saying, basically, I'm in the role of Christ, you're, you're the disciples, and we will build a nation, right, under this rubric. John Kennedy picks it up, um, and then Ronald Reagan picks it up, and Newt Gingrich picks it up. And, but that, to me, is, is a Christianity steeped in American exceptionalism, a Christianity steeped in privilege, a Christianity steeped in uh, trying to hold on to uh, every kind of, of power, social, economic, political, racial, and so on. We then talk about the exodus motif, right? And the exodus motif in this country has been used, I mean, and you referenced it, uh, for centuries and centuries. Um, whether that is in 
uh, you know, the, the worship houses of enslaved peoples, whether that is in um, the Jim Crow South, whether that is in Martin Luther King Jr.'s last speech that he ever gave, the mountaintop speech, where he talks about, he plays the role of Moses in that speech, and he says, I'm not sure I'll get to the promised land, um, but I have seen it, and we're going to get there as a people. That's what he says. And so the Exodus motif is one that says, Christian, you are not the power broker protecting a city on a hill that maybe if the wrong people get in, you might have to build a wall around. But Christian, you are, right, the, the, the person on the margins whose Christianity uh, is part of uh, a story of those who are on the margins. And the Christ that you worship, the Savior that has, um, uh, that, uh, has saved you, was and is and always remains uh, on the side of the poor, the vulnerable, the marginalized, the oppressed. In 2023, those Christians are alive and well and fighting and organizing. And I'm, I'm sure, you know, um, I'm sure, you, you know, that, that many people in the room know all about that. I think that the, there's a couple of hard things here. One, um, on one side of the aisle, and if we just reduce this to, to one side of the aisle or the other, which is, which is reductionistic, but conformity is a sacred value. Right? So you either conform to the community's guidelines and, and rituals and beliefs, or you're out. And many of us have known that. You get, you get out of line at church, and they're like, well, if you want to stay, get back in line. And if you don't, buy. Okay? So when conformity is a sacred value, and independent thinking and diversity is not, you might have a smaller group overall, but that group is mobilized in a straight line very easily. Okay? On the other side, when diversity is celebrated, inclusion is celebrated, um, and it should be, for the record, right, there are so many moving parts, various communities, various lived experiences, various concerns, various um, ways that people have been oppressed and marginalized, and conformity is not a sacred value. So the ability to marginalize in a way that the media notices, that the big donors notice, and that they're willing to put up all the money, um, is, I think, harder. And part of your Christianity and your faith at that point is, is probably interfaith. You're probably working with, you know, Jewish communities, Muslim communities, secular communities, but you're also probably questioning, right, the systems of power and their ways that they perpetuate inequity and injustice. And just by dint of that, right, you're going to scare away some of the power brokers who, who buttress the other side very well. The Koch brothers were not religious people. No. But they spent million, billions of dollars, right, funding things that really helped, uh, you know, religious right communities. So I think that's there. But... One of the things we try to do on my show all the time is say the religious left is here. Uh, that could be the Christian left. That could be um, uh, the, the religious left writ large, whether that includes uh, you know, uh, faith communities of all kinds. Uh, that could be a situation where, and we've talked about this on the show, where the Baptist Joint Committee is arguing for the separation of church and state and freedom from religion as the way to have freedom of religion and doing so with the Freedom From Religion Foundation. Exactly. Right? And so those, you know, I mean, Reverend Barber is, is fighting the, the Poor People's Campaign, right? So I, I don't want to ever make it sound as if the, the Exodus motif and the non-white Christian, the non-white Christian nationalists are nowhere to be found in the country. Unfortunately, they are not the default image of the Christian. In the, you know, so when I, a lot of times in class, I'll say, hey, here's some, here's some people on the screen. Which ones are Christian? And I'll put up, like, you know, Hillary Clinton, okay, or Martin Luther King Jr., and they said, well, Martin Luther King Jr. was a great civil rights leader. And Hillary Clinton, I don't know, she ran for president, secretary of state. And what I try to say is, yeah, but, <laughs> like, Stacey Abrams? Have you all listened to Stacey Abrams? I mean, Stacey Abrams talks about her parents as ministers, her parents, right, as ingraining in her a deep faith. Yet it gets diffused, right? And the, the, the message gets diffused. When you talk about Stacey Abrams, what do you talk about? You talk about political organizing, getting people to vote, uh, an incredible uh, sort of... Uh, just inspirational figure in Georgia who has just changed the, 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 the state's electoral politics. When you talk about Ted Cruz, you always hear about him being a Christian man. You, you see what I mean? When you hear Marco Rubio, it's always, oh yeah, he's a Christian. You know, uh, Christy Nome, South Dakota, Christian, right? Ron DeSantis, I mean, he just made a, a commercial that said on the eighth day, God made a fighter, Ron DeSantis, yeah. Christian. And so... I think that's part of what's happening here is like when most people who love and admire Stacey Abrams think of her, they don't think daughter of two Methodist ministers, you know? So sometimes I think the diffusion um, takes away from the fact that there, there are so many Christians of color, so many black Christians, 
so many uh, religious people in general in the country who are not part of, the, of these groups. Um, but we just don't see them. Like in the mid 20th century, Reinhold Niebuhr and Martin Luther King Jr. were the face, right? Or, or, uh, the mainline traditions are what people thought of when they thought of Christianity. Now when I ask my students, who are the Christians? And, and you know, they, they tell me it's Justin Bieber, right? Yeah. You know, it's Chris Pratt. It's, you know, it's, it's people who are part of, right, really kind of um, upfront, well-funded, right-wing, white Christian spaces. The mainline Christians are not considered the real Christians. And th that's sort of the default image uh, in the country. So anyway, I, I'm rambling now, but I, I hope that makes sense. Yeah. Um, we got one more there, and then question over here. Yeah. Yeah, so what can break a myth, right? So I think in one sense, um, there, are, there, there's, I think there's two answers. One is, I think there's a way in which um, you can realize the story you're participating in um, is really harmful. And there, there's ways that um, realizing that the story you're trying to live out doesn't match up with the reality that you live in um, can help break the, 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 can take the scales off your eyes. And so, you know, what the data shows us is that when people have contact um, with communities outside of their own, and they meet people with different identities and different traditions and different um, ways of living, they often sort of change their stances on things, right? And so, unfortunately, one of the ways that myths are broken is by simple um, contact with communities that are um, usually excluded or demonized or villainized by way of those myths, okay? And so I think that's one. But I, I think the more, the answer that I, or I'd really like to focus on a little bit more that often doesn't get talked about is um, just by telling other myths. And I know that sounds super weird, right? No, it's true. Should we not tell myths? Okay, so let me give you an example. Martin Luther King Jr. holiday was just a couple days ago. One of the things that Martin Luther King Jr. said is, the arc of the universe bends towards justice, okay? And that's, a, that's, a, that's a, a statement that I think a lot of people in the room would say, yeah. I, Can you repeat that? The, the arc of the universe bends towards justice, right? So if the arc of the universe bends towards justice, is that a scientific statement? Is that observable fact? Is that, I mean, we could talk about history, and maybe history does move towards justice, but that's a really zigzag line, you know? You start looking at your history, and it's like, ooh, there's a lot of hairpin turns here. Are we really, did we get towards justice? Because we went backward a lot, right? You know what it is, though? It's a myth. Mm -hmm. And it's a myth that invites all of us to say, you know what? The arc of the universe does bend, bend toward justice. Because history is not written yet, and we can make it so. We can get on a road together and, and link arms and walk it. And we can walk it so that we move that way, and then everyone behind us has a path that they can walk as well. And we can create a universe that bends towards justice. And I'm going to find a role to play in that story. I'm going to find a community to, to, to live that story out with. I'm going to find causes that will make history move that way. I'm going to be a player in this tale. I'm going to live my life in this story. So I'm going to do that through political activism or organizing. I'm going to do that by, by way of protest, by way of backing candidates I believe in, by way of fill in the blank. But if we don't have a story to live, the people that do will always continue to live theirs in ways that are harmful and hurtful and violent. And so I know it sounds hella weird to say, yeah, we just need better myths. But I think we do. Because we all need a story to live. And myth does not have to be life-taking, as in the ones I'm talking about tonight. So many of us live out stories and myths that are life-affirming. They, the, they are the story that we want the world to reflect. And we can try to bring our world in line with them, right? We can try to live a history and, and live a human existence that makes the story we're living out the one that is actually in the world. That is what the human condition is in many ways. So I think we need stories, and I think we need to, to, to try to find ways to share those stories. I think going back to the previous question, when you have communities that are so diverse and, and coming from such different um, places and, and have such different histories and so many facets, finding the way to tell a story that includes everybody and gives them a role and a, and a way to move toward the same place, it takes so much patience, it takes so much kindness, it takes so much learning, so much humility, it's really hard. But what else is worth it, you know? Because if we don't, if we don't want to live uh, a story that moves that way, then you know we we might as well go play pickleball, I guess. You know. Yeah. Um, okay, one more, and then we gotta go.
Question over okay. here. So I think it's important to point out that these white evangelical nationalists uh, are actually uh, evangelicals, right? They take the Bible literally. And, um, you know, I had always believed that the evangelicals kind of got smashed into Scope's trial. And they kind of went into the closet for a long time and, yeah. you know, didn't participate in politics until the 70s when they were discovered by Republican operatives. Yeah. And, uh, you know, they realized they could, you know, throw off your elections. You know, they discovered the tent revivalists and all these people. And then there was all the event televangelists and all that stuff. They realized they could hitchhike on this. Yeah. Right? And they got Jerry Falwell and... Uh, Pat Robertson and uh, the moral majority and everything, yeah. they got Nick's, uh, Reagan elected. Yeah. And so, you know, then we had the Tea Party and the yeah. Koch brothers spending all the money and they realized, you know, they could get this thing really going and stuff, but like now it's kind of gotten out of hand, right? And so they, the Republicans don't really have control over it. Mm -hmm. The Republicans really weren't for... Uh, banning abortion or anything. Donald Trump was for abortion, right? But they're just, they're hitchhiking on that. Mm -hmm. It's just the same as the, uh, 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 you know, targeted mailing program yeah. that just started, yeah. you know, in the 70s, yeah. right? Yeah. But, you know, they just, they're going along with these people and everything. It's not necessarily really their agenda, though. Mm -hmm. Right? What is their agenda? They want to privatize everything. They want to neoliberalize everything. They, you know, yeah. And uh, that's not really in these people's interest. So, you know, what do you have to say about that? So, a couple things. I think is um, I think you're right. There have been people on the American right who have who would c consider themselves politically and philosophically conservative. Whether that's a fiscal po set of policies, policies on. Uh, you know, there were Goldwater supporters that were just very into libertarianism, right? And that's what they would talk about. Um, I don't always, I mean, I think there's a lot to say. Anyone, anyone who tells me they're libertarian, I just say, look, it's not that you don't want the government to intervene. It's just the government already intervened, and you don't want them to do it anymore. Because <laughs> they intervened and it helped you and your, your grand, granddaddy. So um, I don't think there's actually libertarians in the world. Um, that's another story. I think, you're, I, I think there's a, a point that you're making that's really salient, which is that those people that would have called themselves uh, fiscal conservatives, um, ideological conservatives, neoliberals in the 80s, um, it's just really hard for them to exist in this contemporary GOP. Um, I take some issue with, with the way you told the history, I'll, I'll be honest, but where, where I'll at least agree with you a little bit is I just don't see a place for... Um, the fiscal conservative, the neoliberal, the whatever, um, to really exist in the contemporary G GOP um, and have any part in the, the party's kind of um, power uh, structure. So if we look at the House of Representatives that is now a majority GOP, who are the people who are in our face all the time? You know, are they the, the fiscal, are they Mitt Romney's like, air, you know, like buddies? Are they the, the, the sort of folks that would be these hardline um, you know, uh, tighten the belt types and fis no, I mean, some some people may talk about that, but you have to be part of um, the kind of religious conservatism that, that I've been talking about all night. I mean, who's in front of us all the time? Marjorie Taylor Greene and Lauren Boeber, right? And um, the the kind of Christian nationalists and the Trumpists. And so, to me, when somebody's like, not all the Republicans are like this, and it's like, I don't know if that's true or not. But what I do know is the party is showing me who's who. Um, is going to get the, the powerful seats. And the ones that are always in front of me always seem to be the Christian Trumpists and MAGA Nation. So I don't know where, um, you know, John McCain, and I'm not here to sort of sing John McCain's praises, but I don't know where John McCain fits in today. I don't know, right, where someone uh, out of, of that ilk um, goes. Um, I am no fan, and you're recording this, so I just, let's get it straight. I am no fan of Liz Cheney, okay? Somebody told me the other day on a podcast, Liz Cheney for president, and yeah. I've never hung up on a podcast, but, I <laughs> but why was Liz Cheney kicked out of the GOP? Changed her policies on immigration? All of a sudden wanted reparations? No, nope. just turned on the leader. So when you have a political party where if you turn on the leader, you get kicked out, I don't know about y'all, but I've read some history that says that's not, uh, things are not looking good, because if you're only 
modicum of entry or exit is are you devoted to the leader? Have you all read about those kinds of parties from the past? It, it usually ends really, really badly. So it's a really high note to end on, very optimistic. Thanks for coming.